Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Hints and Kinks 2022 Sometimes good solutions are hard to find for the amateur conservator. The Ultradyne Model L2 Super Heterodyne receiver of early 1925 was sold as a kit. Since the RCA would not license their patents to other American firms until they lost a series of anti monopoly judgments around 1930. I've had this Ultradyne for about 40 years and has been largely ignored on a bottom shelf, missing an audio and the remaining audio is not original. The originals were third arson. It has some plastic covered bell wire that can't be original, so it seems that this side could be fixable. The problem with this set is that the original dials with silver plated dial skirts look beyond terrible. It's always a judgment call to whether to present an artifact in a deteriorated condition or to take steps to make it at least somewhat closer to original condition to avoid detracting viewers from the historical significance of the artifact. I had forgotten that years ago I found three new old stock dials of the same pattern. Two of the three dials have indeed survived in like new condition. But first, could the old dials be cleaned at least good enough to look good enough? Short answer, nope. So next question, could these dials be replated with my skills and available shop capabilities? After having owned this Cutting and Washington 11A for more than 25 years, I decided to attempt to use a Jax brand electroless silver plating solution. Earlier I had had great success in cleaning many brass thumb nuts. I tried to clean these brass rings to achieve a, the same bright yellow brass finish, but for unknown reasons the brass would not return to that bright condition. The Jax silver plate solution did not work at all, so I cleaned off the attempt to apply the silver and instead tried some electroless tin plate solution. It did plate onto the rings okay. After some buffing, the rings did look very much like the one surviving silver plate ring. I used the same cleaning techniques on these ultradyne dials and attempted the electroless silver. The same miserable results. I try the electroless tin and still get miserable results. Note that the end cap of the pointer does take on a bright silver color. This is a screw machine part of the dial. My conclusion is that there are just some brass alloys that will not work in electroless plating solutions. So it looks like I'll have to use the new old stock dials. But what am I going to do about the two smaller dial skirts? They seem to be the same lousy alloy. I saw this in another dial silvering YouTube video. Can this work for my radio dials? Heck, they are brass also. I order some silver chloride and follow the process. On my dial skirts, I get more worse than awful results. I've done nickel and some zinc electroplating with Caswell plating supplies for decades. I ordered a brush plating kit for silver, but it can only apply very thin layers of silver. On these dial skirts, it just barely plates a layer that polishes out to a mirror-like silver, a silver that looks nothing like the new old stock dials I have. How to make the plating look like new old stock dials? Experimenting tells me that sandblasting silver plate looks like it would get you there, 
but the silver plate would have to be much heavier than this brush plating wand will give me. But the cost of their smallest silver tank plating kit makes this a deal killer for my project. For now, I'll just have to leave the small dial skirts with my very thin silver plating subjected to a bit of sandblasting in place. The Ultradyne L2 has eight iron wire filament ballast resistors hidden under the tuning and oscillator condensers. Amperites were assembled using a very aggressive acid flux to solder the iron wire. Storage in a damp basement or drafty storage building can enable big time corrosion to the brass nickel plated end caps and iron wire. I need to make some sort of replicas. Yes, they will not be real positive temperature coefficient resistors. I'll install a 5.1 ohm resistor, which will give uh, proper current for a quarter amp tube. I'll fix a little tag on the back of the cabinet saying something like, Replica appearance amperite devices, but not self regulating. Power tube filaments from a fixed 6 volt supply. This 3 quarter inch square QR code tells you that. I rig up a really crude scanner, a little turntable. I glue a little number band around one end cap on the amperite. I can then rotate the ballast and snap pictures. I crop each picture to be only one number segment wide and then assemble a composite image that tells me almost exactly where the text and graphics should be located. This becomes a template. I add layers of text and graphics as required. You can get satin gold paper for laser printers. I print a negative print on the paper and get what I think is an excellent recreation of the decal wrapped around the original part. I order some 7 16th inch diameter brass bar stock and turn replica end caps on my little lathe. I nickel plate the caps. The body is fiberglass rod drilled and turned to fit the end caps. A 5.1 ohm 2 watt resistor substitutes for the ballast if there is a 6 volt fixed supply voltage. The laser print negative image is printed on gold paper and wrapped on the body. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission estimated that in 2006, injuries from plastic packaging resulted in approximately 6,000 emergency room visits. But treat this material like a misplaced resource. Here is a use for tiny bits of this misplaced resource. Many specialty screws are frequently lost on old radios. Some had retainers that were lost. Use a tiny square of this PET sheet to keep the screw in place. Burn a hole through with a hot iron and thread it on. Got a Westinghouse Areola Senior or Junior with hopeless silver plated dials? Here is a way of making reasonably good looking replica overlays. Recently, I needed to make replacement decals for this circa 1922 Peerless brand audio transformer. At left is an audio I had in my junk box. It had an outline of a decal on it, but the printing was gone. I posted queries on antique radio forums and a Facebook group. A guy on Facebook identified it as a Peerless and posted the picture on the right side of this slide. 
I needed to make a black on gold replica decal. There are specialty decal papers in metallic gold that can apparently be printed on using a laser printer. I have no experience with that and I was looking for a quick solution. I thought my local craft store might have rolls of gold wrapping paper or sheets of gold paper for scrapbooking. However, there was nothing even close to the look of the gold used on vintage decals. Just as I was about to give up, I came across a product identified as vellum gold metallic. It is thin as regular paper, but is translucent. I thought that would not meet my needs at all. However, I bought a few sheets anyway. I tried running the sheet through my inexpensive Brother Laser black and white printer, and the image was good and crisp. I then realized that I could simply spray the back of this vellum with gold enamel to make it opaque. That worked perfectly. I could carefully cut out my replica and hold it upside down with a pair of needle nose tweezers in order to spray on a thin and even coat of Scotch 77 contact adhesive. This worked very well indeed. A friend and a guy on Facebook provided me with three audios. Once I had them in hand, it was very easy to resize my image to near perfect dimensions. There is a silver version of this paper product at my crafts store. What could be done with it? There are multiple sources of this paper to be found online if it's not at your local shop. I've seen too many Westinghouse Areola radios with severely deteriorated silver plate dials. At some point, many may consider them unsuitable for display. There is a way to make them look very pleasing without destroying the original remaining graphics. Create an overlay if you have access to a black and white laser printer. My brother brand printer that cost about $130 works just fine for this application. Or your local office supply print shop can print the graphics file on your specialty paper for you. Laser print the PDF file actual size on vellum silver metallic paper from core donations. Punch or cut the hole in the center of the graphics. Insert a 1 quarter inch or 5 16 inch spacer or rod in the center hole to use as a guide pen. Locate other holes and punch or melt through with a soldering iron tip. Spray the back side of the vellum with silver, nickel, oyster, or white lacquer. There is a great variation in spray paints. I think the oyster or Dover white on the Krylon charts might be the best, but I did not have any at the time of making this photo. Then spray the back side of the painted surface with Scotch 77 contact cement. Apply your overlay to a cleaned vintage dial plate using the center hole guide pin and one of the other holes you punch. Use a soft cloth in a circular motion to ensure that there are no trapped air pockets. Trim the periphery with a razor blade. This Areola Senior has almost perfect original dials. There is only a slight yellow discoloration to their surface. Number one is a virgin satin silver plate replica dial made some 30 plus years ago by the master craftsman, the late Roland Matson. Number two is an overlay sprayed with Valspar brand nickel finish enamel on the back side. Number three is an overlay sprayed with satin white on the back side and a light airbrush overspray of lacquer dyed with transparent honey amber dye. You might consider other colors. Krylon has a gloss Dover white. Don't like the results? Heat applied from a hair dryer is all that is necessary 
to allow the overlay to be lifted off. Any cement residue should soften and release with ordinary mineral spirits that should have no effect on the original graphic. Just scan this QR code to take you to my web page where you can download the PDF graphic and a PDF copy of this PowerPoint presentation. Using UV Cure Adhesive to make structural repairs to broken Bakelite cabinets. Just filling Bakelite cracks with adhesive is seldom good enough. The break should be reinforced. Here is a worst case scenario, a case with previous repair attempts. This is a 1929 Siemens RFE 33 broadcast receiver in a Bakelite cabinet. This is very early for a Bakelite radio cabinet, and the radio chassis is very heavy, far too heavy for a Bakelite molding with such relatively thin walls and wholly inadequate internal reinforcing ribs. This photo shows less than half of the damaged areas of this cabinet. The smears you see are epoxy residue. One way to remove it is to lay scrap cloth over the surface and saturate with acetone, lacquer thinner that is. Lay a couple of sheets of plastic wrap over the soaked cotton. Then lay a piece of cotton terry cloth on top of that, followed by a sheet of scrap MDF shelving or any other material to provide a weighted cushion to keep the solvent against the old adhesive. Be patient. An overnight weight would be ideal. Then remove the softened epoxy with a plastic scraper and rag soaked with more solvent. Before I started my work here, there was an opening crack that I stabilized with aluminum foil tape. If you have a cabinet with badly assembled pieces using epoxy glue, it would be ideal to try to separate the pieces. This may not be possible because there are running cracks. If so, try to bring the cracks together as much as possible immediately after finishing your cleanup with solvent. Use whatever clamps are necessary to bring the cracks together. Maybe use a strap clamp. If not possible, consider applying self-stick aluminum foil tape across the cracks. Take time to burnish the tape for the best adhesion. It can be easily removed later with a heat gun set on gentle heat. Now you are ready to work inside your cabinet. Someone had attempted to apply what I think is a black epoxy potting compound to use as a filler and backing for the cracks that had been glued with some sort of clear two-part epoxy adhesive. The red arrows point to chips of the old compound showing almost no adhesion to the Bakelite. Leveling this sloppy work proved very difficult. 6 or 80 grit aluminum oxide sandpaper fills quickly and does not conform well. The best tool I found for removal is a high quality slitting saw blade driven by a Dremel tool running at a relatively low speed. Of course, proper eye protection, a steady grip, and dust mass should be considered mandatory. What to use as reinforcement? Fiberglass cloth seems to be a natural for this application. There is a wide range of cloth weights. It is sold by weight per square yard. 7.5 ounce is easily available at auto parts stores. You will want to have a lighter weight cloth on hand as well. 0 0.075 to 1.5 ounce weight. This weight range is used in production of printed circuit boards and for remote control model aircraft, and there are a number of eBay vendors that have it at very low cost. The traditional way to bond the cloth is to use a liquid mix of two-part epoxy resin, applying a coat of resin to the surface 
and then laying in a blanket of the cloth, followed by enough resin to saturate the cloth. The resin can take several hours to reach maximum strength. Another way is to saturate the cloth with low viscosity cyanoacrylate adhesive. This requires an accelerator curing agent to be applied. Apply too much curing agent and the adhesive will cure too fast and generate too much heat. The resulting cured adhesive can be too brittle. Have a hog bristle brush handy to tamp down the cloth into the resin. Keep this brush thoroughly cleaned in solvent and used when completely dry of the solvent. A better method is to use UV cure adhesive. These adhesives can provide superior peel strength adhesion to Bakelite. A 50 milliliter bottle of hard type resin can be in your mailbox from China for less than $10. It is commonly sold for jewelry and other craft uses. Don't buy larger containers. Most products are only usable for about a year, maybe a bit longer if refrigerated. You can buy a UV cure lamp powered from a USB phone charger for about $15 on eBay. The charger is not included. Any generic phone charger rated at a nominal 5 volts and 1 amp will work just fine. Applying UV cure adhesive gives you plenty of time to work out air bubbles and push away excess resin. Sand area to uniform cloudy surface and thoroughly clean with alcohol applied with a gauze pad. Wear a nitrile disposable glove on your hand that you hold the pad with. That way the oil on your fingers will not contaminate the alcohol and leave residue on the Bakelite. This is difficult to photograph, but two beads of the UV cure adhesive were laid down. Then a sheet of fiberglass cloth is laid over the adhesive. You use the dry hog bristle brush and tweezers to position the cloth. Then lay on a sheet of clear mylar, otherwise known as pet film, over the cloth. You can now use your finger to massage the resin into the cloth and force air bubbles to the edge of your cloth. You will probably find that you applied too little or too much resin. Carefully lift the mylar sheet and add or remove resin. Replace the sheet and smooth out again. Keep the sheet in place and bring the UV lamp into position. This lamp, held very close, will cure the resin in 20 seconds through a layer of fiberglass roving cloth. For the best finish, leave the lamp in place for a minute or two before peeling off the film. You will have an almost transparent patch. Here I elected to apply a thin sheet of fiberglass cloth. It simply makes it easier to see that I have brought the cloth into the closest possible contact with the cracks. I can immediately lay down more beads of adhesive into which I can lay a second sheet of heavier weight roving cloth. After you are finished applying whatever reinforcements are necessary, apply a coat of flat color spray paint and the repair should become relatively hard to spot. On the subject of modern adhesives, Think twice about using forever glues. The problem here is that the previous owner used a mystery adhesive that really had no adhesion to the phenolic board stock. But I've had zero luck in removing it so I could apply a more appropriate cement. Whatever it is, it resists acetone, nitromethane, alcohol, MEK, trichloroethane, Goof off, gasoline, I'm out of ideas.
There are a hundred or more pictures of this little Telefunken 30W radio of 1929 vintage on the web, but a Google search shows no original wiring. I began queries to everyone I know. After three weeks of search, no luck. Are these wires plain black rubber, or do they have braided fabric coverings? And do the wires have different color insulation? I had to know. The previous owner had rewired the radio with wires salvaged by cutting up an 18-gauge vinyl insulated lamp cord. That would never do for a radio in my collection. I visited radiomuseum.org often, but they did not have my elusive pictures on their site. With the aid of Google Translate, I make queries in German and come across Radio Bassler Forum, RBF, i.e. Radio Hobbyist Forum. It's easy to join, and I had my answer in less than a day. My only comment is if you have not used translating tools like Google Translate before, is to make your sentences grammatically correct, simple, precise, short, and polite. Take the German translation you get from Google and translate it back into English. You may find that you need to choose different English words to get the correct meaning. Odd that you make specific requests and people send you pictures of obvious modern plastic insulated wire. Thankfully, though, one person responded as requested. I use Photoshop to boost the color saturation as high as possible. Sometimes that will show some of the original tint. In this case, it appears that all five dark colored wires are simply black rubber covered stranded wire of about 20 AWG. One wire is a natural white rubber. They assembled these wires into a cable harness with likely waxed linen cord. Easy to replicate. My way to duplicate vintage rubber covered wire is to use UL3132 soft silicone rubber wire available on eBay. Increase the diameter by using 332nd inch diameter, 2 to 1 shrink ratio thin wall heat shrink polyolefin tubing. This tubing is available in various colors and can be stained with aniline wood dyes such as Mohawk ultra penetrating stains to make the wiring look aged. Tefag Super K5A of 1940-41 vintage. I bought it years ago just because it had those strange looking Telefunken metal tubes that first appear in 1938 model German sets. The Bakelite case has a crack in the side and the flat glass dial cover was shattered into pieces. That being the case, I think I only paid $40 or so for the set, and I doubt that it would bring much more than that today if the buyer did not do some research. But some modern online research discloses that this German design, which was Lorenz's first ACDC table model receiver, was built in German occupied France. The German factories being engaged in war material production. These home broadcast receivers could be shipped back home to Germany and also exported to neutral countries where the revenue could buy foreign resources and manufactured goods. The actual French manufacturing factory I have not been able to determine. The cabinet was broken in shipment. Cardboard packaging around the glass tubes was never removed, so it appears that this set has never been powered up since the day it left the factory, except for my installing a new sheet of glass to cover the dial. This eighty plus year old survivor remains a wonderfully preserved near perfect historic record 
of the manufacturing practices of the day. I would never attempt to power it up or replace parts just to make it work for a little while longer. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.